All right, council member, uh, we're now live on YouTube. At this point, we've been joined by our um, public witness, uh, the commissioner, as well as the nominee. We're still waiting to be joined by um, the chair of the Commission on Human Rights, but I think um, you can go ahead and get started uh, when you're ready. Good afternoon. I'm uh, Robert White, council member at large and chair of the Committee on Government Operations and Facilities. Today is Thursday, December 15th, 2022, and we are meeting remotely via the Zoom teleconferencing platform. The time is now 2.31 p.m., and I'm calling to order this public roundtable of the committee. Today is our last planned roundtable for the council period. We just finished our last official meeting of the committee to vote on our committee activity report. I wanna thank everyone here for joining us as we close in on the end of the year. The purpose of this roundtable is to discuss proposed resolution 24-1039, the Director of the Office of Human Rights, Nin Kine, confirmation resolution of 2022. The Office of Human Rights or OHR is a critically important agency. Its primary function is to enforce the Human Rights Act of 1977 by providing a forum for free administrative investigations and adjudications when someone brings a claim of unlawful discrimination. Nin Khan is a Ward 4 resident who has been serving as OHR's interim director since October, 2021. Before that, she worked at OHR for several years in other roles, including general counsel and legislative affairs manager. She has also worked as a civil rights attorney in private practice and as a policy professional. Over the last year, this committee has had the opportunity to hear directly from interim director Khan on several occasions, including in performance and budget oversight hearings, as well as hearings on proposed civil rights legislation. I will say at the outset that I've been impressed by Ms. Kine's thoughtful, candid testimony at past hearings and her willingness to work toward policy compromises with the council, with civil rights advocates, and with other government agencies. But it's also important that we hold roundtables on all of our nominees, if possible, so that there's an open opportunity to identify any issues. And we need to know that OHR in particular will have strong leadership as the agency handles new responsibilities, expands its workforce, and works to recover from a critical case backlog. The mayor submitted proposed resolution 24-1039 on October 28th. If the council takes no action, then under mayor's, uh, then under our laws, Ms. Kine's nomination <clears throat> will be deemed approved on February 8th, 2023. It's unclear which council committee will have jurisdiction over OHR at that point, but I'm sure I speak for all of my colleagues on the current committee on government operations and facilities when I say that we will remain attentive to this agency and the laws it enforces. <clears throat> Before we uh, hear from witnesses, I want to lay out the ground rules. Everyone should have received a copy of the witness list. Um, we have actually one uh, uh, advisory neighborhood commissioner now who will testify, uh, then an OHR commissioner, and then we will hear from the nominee. Uh, with that, let me call uh, our first panel, which consists of advisory neighborhood commissioner Kishan Huta. Hello. Good afternoon, welcome. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Chairman uh, White, and thanks for including me uh, on short notice. Uh, I really appreciate it. You can hear me okay, right? can hear you just fine. Okay, great. Uh, I'm gonna be quite short, uh, but I did wanna speak in support today of Nin Kang for this uh, position. Um, uh, this important position in DC. I, I'm an ANC commissioner. Um, I've been uh, in, uh, elected in two different neighborhoods, uh, ANC 2B and now ANC 2E. Um, and I'm, I'm also a former commissioner on uh, the mayor's AAPI commission. And I've followed the work of the Office of Human Rights for many years and have been very impressed. And uh, I was very pleased to know that um, that uh, that there the the new director is someone who has already worked there for many years because their work I've been a, a strong admirer of, especially on issues uh, that are close to my heart, such as um, 
uh, hate crimes uh, work and uh, efforts to educate uh, the public and officials on hate crimes in DC, whether it be um, on anti-Semitism, on uh, um, uh, against the Muslim community, uh, and uh, of, of course the AAPI community as well. Um, the the Office of Human Rights uh, under uh, in the interim director, Nin Kang, has reached out to advisory neighborhood commissions uh, as well, uh, often. And that's really a, a refreshing and appreciated and speaks very highly and bodes very well for her uh, as a director. So I really appreciate that as well and uh, encourage um, her to, uh, to continue to do so. And I'm sure she will. I was glad to hear that uh, in her background, uh, She's done a lot of work on supporting the rights of tipped workers as well, which is another issue that I care a lot about, um, uh, especially in the Asian American community uh, with so many and the immigrant community, uh, which I've done a lot of work with. I really appreciate that work. And of course, uh, she has a lot of experience with as well, uh, which I, I think is very excellent because we are a city of immigrants and um, they need more representation. And I think that uh, this will go a long way towards doing so uh, with Director Kang. Um, the uh, most recently, just uh, I think it was last week, uh, the Office of Human Rights held a, a gala and award ceremony. And my family was privileged to attend and really was just very impressed. Uh, council member, if you didn't make it, uh, or if you haven't been before, uh, I hope you go to their gala in the future and their awards ceremony. You'll be so impressed with the awardees, um, uh, the young people in our city who are fighting for uh, human rights. In fact, I learned so much from following the Office of Human Rights, even on social media. Um, I think there's their most recent Facebook post is about how two new uh, traits have been added to the list of uh, traits that are protected in DC, uh, homeless status and uh, sealed eviction records. And it's, uh, you know, I wouldn't have known otherwise. Uh, it's, you know, as, as, as you know, uh, uh, Chairman White, it's one thing for the city to uh, take action and to protect rights. It's another thing for the community and the residents to know uh, what the city is doing and what rights and what programs we have and what rights are protected. So I was glad that that was on social media. And uh, I I hope that the that, that news will get out widely to the uh, to the public as well. And I plan to let my ANC and residents know about it. And I hope uh, 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 Director Kang will be confirmed and will come and visit our ANC in the future. Um, I really um, I can't recommend her highly enough. And uh, uh, thank you for your time today and for listening to me. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Commissioner. I, I appreciate you uh, joining to, to weigh in. Um, I know commissioners uh, have a lot on their plates uh, in commission duties, family duties, work duty. So I appreciate you uh, weighing in uh, on, on this nominee and, and join you in appreciating the work that uh, OHR is doing with respect to, to new protected classes. We, we actually work really hard to, to, to get those done. Uh, so thank you for, for joining us. Um, I don't have any questions, but I, I do have some for the, um, for the nominee and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get to her soon. Uh, so Commissioner Puta, thanks so much. Uh, our next uh, panel will um, include, actually, I need to check with my team to understand if we are separating the commission from the nominee, which I think so. So let me ask my team to let me know. Uh, yes, yeah, so our next uh, panel will be Chair of the Commission on Human Rights, Matoko Azawa. Uh, welcome. Good afternoon, Chair President White and the members and staff of the Committee on Government Operations and Facilities. My name is Motoko Aizawa, and I'm the Chair of the DC Commission on Human Rights. My colleague, Karen Mohauser, the Vice Chair of the Commission, and I thank you for the opportunity to offer this joint testimony in support of the confirmation of Ning Aing to become the Office 
Director of the DC Office of Human Rights. First, by way of introduction, the DC Commission on Human Rights is a quasi-independent body of the DC government responsible primarily for helping to adjudicate complaints of discrimination brought under the DC Human Rights Act. The commission also provides an appeals process to applicants who were found ineligible for employment under the Criminal Background Checks for Protection of Children, uh, Children Act. Cited by administrative law judges, the commissioners form tribunals to review and finalize decisions. The commission is comprised of up to 15 commissioners who are uncompensated volunteers nominated by the mayor and confirmed by the DC Council. In addition to this former role, we also play an informal role of helping to raise awareness about the DC Human Rights Act, which affords protection against discrimination for those who live or work in DC or visit the city. In executing these functions, we work in close coordination with the Office of Human Rights. In October of 2021, when Ms. Kine was appointed as interim director of the Office of Human Rights, both the Office and the Commission on Human Rights were in a state of flux. The Office had experienced three directors in a span of a couple of years, while the Commission's Chief Administrative Law Judge position was filled only a few months ago, after two of her predecessors left in close succession. As a new chair who was appointed in 2020 after the former chair of the Commission had resigned, I knew that both the office and the commission needed and deserved continuity and stability. Director Kine joined the Office of Human Rights in 2015 and rose to the position of general counsel in 2018. By the time of her appointment as interim director, she was intimately familiar with the state of the office. So she rolled up her sleeves and went to work. During her short tenure, she oversaw significant growth of the office. The end of fiscal year 2022 saw the office staff uh, capacity increase by nearly 40% compared to the previous fiscal year. With the additional human resources, she put significant efforts into reducing the number of backlogged complaints, despite the ever increasing number of incoming complaints. And she reached out to many DC communities in need of assistance through listening lab events, uh, language access programs, youth bullying prevention initiatives, uh, training, and many other activities. Interim Director Kine brings to the office a management style that is both structured and disciplined. She collects and uses data effectively to explain the office's contribution to the improved state of human rights protection in the district. She's an energetic problem solver, and we are happy to also note that she is inclusive, collaborative, and transparent. To the Commission on Human Rights, Interim Director Kine brings a sense of continuity and focus, as well as keen willingness to collaborate with the Commission. With her encouragement, the Commission has been steadily forming tribunals to help close outstanding cases, especially those that have been pending for years. Together, we amended some parts of the DC municipal regulations that caused confusion for complainants. And just last week, as the previous commissioner spoke, uh, the commission held a successful annual human rights gala event, celebrating a number of human rights champions and emerging youth leaders in the district in very close collaboration with many dedicated staff members from the office, led by interim director Kine herself. We expect this event will serve as an instructive template for the commission's future outreach work in the district, especially reaching out to youth and young adults. Chairman White and the members of the members and staff of the Committee on Government Operations and Facilities, it is our strongly held view that Interim Director Kine has proved herself to be more than capable. In addition to her numerous accomplishments with the Office of Human Rights, she has proved to be a valuable and trusted partner of the Commission on Human Rights. For this reason, we strongly support her confirmation as Director of the Office of Human Rights and look forward to strengthening our partnership and to contributing to the protection and enhancement of human rights for all in the district. Thank you very much. 
Uh, thank you very much uh, for your testimony, Chairperson Azawa. Uh, let me ask you just a, a couple questions. Um, you, you mentioned uh, transition, the need for uh, stability and good leadership in, in the agency. In, in your view, what, what are the biggest uh, one or two challenges within the agency that um, Director Kine will, will, will have to uh, work through and, and, and get into a, a, a steady place? Well, um, Chairman White, I only have a glimpse into the working of the office through the, uh, my participation in the commission. So I cannot really speak for the entire office. Just looking at the state of the office um, as it is now, um, she has been blessed with this uh, phenomenal growth of the office. And so I would imagine that the challenge going forward is to actually deploy all those human resources effectively and uh, applying those resources to the priorities of the department. Um, and uh, the, the department is, um, ever uh, tasked with additional uh, responsibilities because the DC Council has been very effective in passing new protective legislation. And so that the mandate continues to increase and the staffing uh, happily has increased. But then uh, I think that there is a tremendous management challenge in terms of deploying staffing to meet the new challenges as well as existing challenges. So I think Director Kine has a lot on her plate, but um, I have uh, great faith in her ability to tackle this very methodically. Thank you. I appreciate that. And, and with respect to the relationship between the agency and the commission, um, do, do you think that that needs to improve in any particular way? Um, excuse my, my dog bark in the background. Um, I have one too who may bark during this hearing as well, so no problem. Thank you. Um, I, as I said in my testimony, we were, um, we built a very good partnership uh, um, ever since, um, well, even before she has become the interim director uh, in her capacity as general counsel. And uh, we look forward to continuing this partnership. Um, we are, um, as I mentioned in my testimony, our role is to adjudicate, but also we do have this informal role of outreach, and uh, we need to work together with the office in both of our, our roles. And uh, so, and, and I think Director Kine is very aware what it takes for the office and the commission to collaborate so that we can deliver uh, the best outcomes in, in uh, respect of both of these roles. Um, so part of it is a dedication of her time and, and her, her staff resources, also financial resources. But I think the most important thing is that her orientation uh, towards the commission is absolutely right. And uh, she's dedicated to uh, working together. And so uh, again, here I have a very strong faith in her ability to continue this uh, valuable partnership that we have enjoyed so far. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate that. Well, I, I want to thank you for uh, for for your testimony, for weighing in uh, on the nomination, uh, hearing from the chair in particular of the Commission on Human Rights is, is particularly important for for the committee. So, uh, thank you again uh, for for weighing in, and thank you for the, your work on the commission. All right, we will uh, now move to our nominee. Uh, so, I want to uh, welcome. Acting Director Nin Khan. Good afternoon, Chairperson. Good afternoon, Director. How are you doing today? I'm well, thank you. How about you? I'm doing well, thanks. Doing well. Um, as, as you know, it's the practice of this committee to swear on our government witnesses. So I ask that you raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you are about to provide to the committee on government operations and facilities is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Wonderful. Well, you can uh, begin your testimony when you're ready. 
Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, thanks for having me on a, on a rainy day today. Uh, good afternoon, Chairperson White and members and staff of the Committee on Government Operations and Facilities. I am Nin Kine, Acting Director of the Office of Human Rights. As a proud resident of Ward 4, I'm honored to have been nominated by Mayor Muro Bowser to lead OHR. I welcome the opportunity to discuss my background, experience, and vision for the agency as follows. With over 15 years of experience as an attorney in civil and human rights and a near native Washingtonian from Myanmar, I'm excited to lead the Office of Human Rights. I grew up in Ward 6 and frequented neighborhoods like Benning Road, Deanwood, Ivy City, and Trinidad. I have called the district my home since the late 1980s, and nothing brings me more joy than to have this opportunity to give back to my community and advance human rights in our city. My professional experience in human rights dates back to law school when I worked on employment and labor law cases as a summer associate in New York and Florida. During this time, I conducted numerous intakes and as a result, learned to quickly identify legal issues within a given set of facts. Subsequently, I had the honor of working on issues like voting rights and affirmative action alongside the Honorable Congressman John Conyers Jr. and his staff at the Judiciary Committee at the U.S. House of Representatives. The experience there gave me the opportunity to hone my legal writing skills as I worked with expert lawyers, not only on legislation, but also on drafting committee reports, as well as contributing to filing an amicus brief with the U.S. Supreme Court. Upon graduation from law school in 2007, I immediately joined a civil rights litigation firm representing plaintiffs in employment discrimination cases under laws like Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Americans with Disabilities Act, the Age Discrimination and Employment Act, the Family and Medical Leave Act, as well as under local laws like the DC Human Rights Act. These cases spanned claims in both state and federal courts to include Florida, Washington, DC, and New York. As a civil rights litigation attorney, I had the experience of filing many, many charges of discrimination with the EEOC, as well as local offices like OHR, where I drafted charges, mediated cases, and appeared at hearings. Where cases were not resolved at administrative level, I litigated my cases through the court system, during which I had the opportunity to engage in mediations, discovery, and trials. Subsequently, I transitioned to a policy role as a fellow with the National Employment Lawyers Association, where I gained invaluable experience working with community-based organizations, advocates, and legislators on issues like age discrimination and removal of arbitration clauses from employment agreements. Hungry to litigate again, I next established my own civil rights litigation practice in DC, where I flourished for four years representing plaintiffs and advising businesses on employment matters. During this time, I became deeply invested in educating the community about anti-discrimination laws, particularly about the unique and expansive nature of the DC Human Rights Act. As I consistently learned that while many in the employment industry were familiar with federal anti-discrimination laws, they knew very little, if at all, about the groundbreaking and progressive provisions under the DC Human Rights Act. In order to expand my reach in educating the community, I volunteered and partnered with organizations like Employment Justice Center, Bread for the City, DC Bar, and as it happens, the Office of Human Rights to help conduct its Know Your Rights trainings. While engaging in these events, I became interested in working for the office. And in March, 2015, I was selected to become OHR's Legislative Affairs Manager. From that point on, I have served in various capacities at OHR, including as Deputy Director and General Counsel. My successes in these roles include drafting the first ever youth bullying prevention regulations, amending the Language Access Act regulations, creating OHR's first ever enforcement guidance documents, which provide information to the public on how OHR interprets certain complex legal claims. Examples of these guidance include documents like understanding source of income discrimination and what the Protect and Pregnant Workers Fairness Act requires of employers. I have since received positive feedback from the community of the usefulness of these documents and courts now rely on these guidance documents as well. Other accomplishments include developing and creating a three-part EEO training program for the district's EEO counselors, which resulted in hundreds of counselors and officers being trained by the Office of Human Rights. As general counsel, I had the opportunity to better serve our communities by enhancing OHR's role in prosecuting probable cause findings before the Commission on Human Rights. In engaging in this work, I had the honor of getting to know and working alongside our esteemed commissioners who are so dedicated and passionate about doing impactful work on the Commission. 
After serving as general counsel on October 1st, 2021, I was appointed interim director. Having performed the functions of a director in the last year and based on my long tenure at OHR, I have learned a great deal about what this job entails and I remain certain in my ability to lead this agency. I have benefited from all the support and professional development that comes from being an agency general counsel in network supported by the mayor's office of legal counsel and by the deputy mayor's office when I became interim director. From an operational perspective, I've led the agency through a budget cycle, oversight hearings, and production of annual and required reports. In short, I believe that my experience as a civil rights litigator, my dedication to OHR, our staff, and the people we serve, as well as my performance in the interim capacity, gave the mayor the confidence to nominate me for your confirmation today. I will now highlight some of the agency's success during my tenure as interim director. OHR is the executive's chief human rights enforcement agency charged with providing investigation and adjudication services for complaints of discrimination. Once a complaint is filed at OHR, the agency offers mediation, investigation, and adjudication services. Over the past year, OHR has been on a path to rebuild, but OHR has also had to expand as the agency has doubled in size due to a number of new laws taking effect in the last three years. At the same time, OHR has strived to maintain or improve its service levels. With this background, I'm proud to report the following accomplishments, which I believe led to my nomination to be director. In FY22, I focused on investing in our people. Working closely with our HR manager and the Department of Human Resources, I was able to increase OHR's staffing capacity by 39%, which provided OHR with much needed additional investigators, attorneys, and the establishment of our fourth enforcement team, to name a few. This accomplishment resulted in reducing the caseload for investigators and doubling the legal team, which allowed the Office of the General Counsel to finally keep up with the caseload and added laws. With the combination of these achievements, in quarter four of FY22, OHR was able to double its case processing rate and see a reduction in our inventory of aged cases. As an agency fighting to protect human rights, I thought it was critical to reestablish ties with our community members, as well as sister agencies, especially after the distance we experienced from COVID. To that end, I held quarterly meetings with community-based organizations to listen to concerns they may have and provide updates about developments at OHR. I also connected with several directors of agencies to discuss how we can work together, not only to comply with human rights laws, but to advance equality and access to government services. My vision as interim also included increasing training for the public in order to achieve our mission of eradicating discrimination. And I'm proud to share that in FY22, we trained more people than ever under our human rights liaison training program. We educated parents about combating youth bullying prevention through a number of uh, trainings, as well as making resource materials more accessible. We continue to conduct field tests, as well as several language access trainings to over 64 plus covered entities. Most significantly, we listen to our residents through the reestablishment of our listening labs. FY22 also presented a number of new programs for OHR to implement. One such program was our work under the TIP Wage Workers Fairness Act. And with gratitude to my program manager and his team, I'm pleased to share we successfully launched our Train the Trainer program and connected with hundreds of businesses on preventing sexual harassment in the TIP wage industry. Another new program was under the Racial Equity Achieves Results Act, where we again successfully worked with the newly established Mayor's Office on Racial Equity to develop training materials as well as other educational resources. These are just a few highlights of the agencies accomplished under my tenure as interim. If I'm confirmed, I'll be glad to offer more details on agency accomplishments as well as performance metrics at the agency oversight and budget hearings in the coming months. I will now transition to briefly discuss my vision for OHR should I be confirmed. At OHR and across the district, Mayor Bowser's administration, the big goal, of course, is to instill what we call DC values across the city, to make the city and its employers, housing providers, and places of public accommodation be genuinely welcoming and non-discriminatory. But when discrimination does occur, or people believe they have, been sub they have been subjected to discrimination, my goal is for people to know where to turn that OHR provides a free investigation service and that they will get a fair process at the Office of Human Rights. 
Internally at OHR, my vision continues to be to invest in our people, provide resources and improve systems, and to keep ties with our communities. I will share just a few specific goals. With enforcement of five new laws for OHR and FY23, we will continue to grow. With this growth, I believe it is vital for OHR to have more structure and management oversight. Thus, I am reorganizing the agency to add several new positions to include associate directors to oversee the various functional units. Additional HR support to address the needs of what is now a much larger team at OHR and an IT specialist to maintain and assist with OHR's information technology systems. Additionally, I will continue to build on our work at FY22 to establish a career path and incentive awards for our hardworking staff at OHR. Another investment in people includes having well-functioning systems. Thus, I plan to complete our work in having a robust case management system for both OHR and the Commission on Human Rights. Another system improvement includes the manner in which we process our cases. To improve our case processing time, I have worked with our managers to develop a new plan for FY23 that will ensure new cases are processed in a timely manner while we are working on older cases. Finally, to continue our ties with the community and to keep them abreast of new developments at OHR, we will be installing quarterly open houses at OHR where the community can come to the office to learn more about OHR and meet OHR's team. And in fact, we did one such event today and I'm proud to report uh, of the support of the community who attended and learned about the new laws being enforced at OHR. In sum, Chair, I want to say, I fully understand and am committed to the mission of OHR. I know its statutory responsibilities, human rights laws, as well as OHR's budget, personnel, and organizational needs. I have the energy and determination to help the agency fulfill its mission in a fair, timely, and perhaps even visionary manner. I'm honored for the opportunity to lead OHR and grateful for Mayor Bowser for nominating me. Before concluding entirely, I would be remiss if I didn't take the opportunity at this point to acknowledge and thank the passionate and hardworking staff at OHR who makes this all possible. I am proud to work alongside some of the most passionate and dedicated civil rights professionals in government. They come to work each and every day with zeal and compassion to serve our most vulnerable populations. Chairperson White, thank you for this opportunity to testify today. I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Director. Uh, we we have known you for for years, and in, uh, in this capacity, and and in your uh, immediately previous um, capacity. So so we, we know your work and, and know you pretty well. Uh, so I don't have a ton of of questions, um, but, uh, but but I do want to delve into to a few things. Um, first, uh, it really just, we got to check a couple important boxes. Uh, as you know, the law requires that the director have a demonstrated professional background in anti-discrimination law. Uh, you have listed several things, including and prior to uh, your work at OHR. Uh, I think your, your statement was uh, captured everything, but uh, just in case, is there anything with respect to background in anti-discrimination law that was not covered in your testimony that you want to mention? Uh, thank you for the opportunity, Chairperson, but, but I don't think so. I think my testimony was quite, quite expansive. Uh, I agree. Um, if confirmed, do you intend to remain a DC resident throughout your tenure? Yes, Chair. Have you, uh, have you identified any potential conflicts of interest or situations that may create the appearance of conflicts of interest? No. Um, in, uh, in recent years, the mayor and the council have agreed on uh, significant increases to OHR's uh, budget and, and staff size, including one that took effect right when you became director. Can you uh, give us a status update on your hiring efforts? Sure, I'm, I'm proud to report chair that um, as I mentioned in my testimony, I was able to increase the um, staffing capacity by 39%. Uh, we had uh, about 51 active uh, FTEs within OHR and we hired 22 additional. And so that is where the 39% comes from. And I, I'm super 
I'm proud of our HR manager as, as well as our partnership with DCHR, which made all of that possible. Um, our operations team was one uh, HR manager and another administrative manager, and uh, we were able to, to hire those individuals who've been very valuable to the agency. Appreciate it. Well, kudos to, to that team. Uh, that is not a, a small undertaking. Um, and and uh, it's, it's been my sense that staffing up has, has moved pretty pretty well and pretty quickly uh, since you have, have been interim director. Um, how, how many um, how many open FTEs do, do you have? We currently have 13, several of which are new for FY23. Okay. As well as 22. Okay. Uh, and in the sense of, I, I, you, you have discussed some structural changes to the office and, and some of our hearings. Have, have you changed your, your leadership team or leadership structure at all? I have not chair, but as I outlined in the testimony, my plan, if confirmed, is to put in place associate directors as opposed to one deputy director in, in order to oversee the different functional units. Uh, I believe as OHR grows, uh, we need more management oversight uh, in those particular areas. Okay. And, and how do you how do you plan to get there? So we're already recruiting. Uh, my HR manager is currently working with DCHR to have in place these job descriptions known as associate directors that have never existed within OHR's uh, 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 pool of uh, position descriptions. So therefore, we have to go through that process to get that established. And uh, But we have been informally recruiting for that through the various job fairs that the mayor held a few weeks ago, as well as that DCHR held just last week. And we are we have um, we're very hopeful to be able to fill those positions in January and February. In addition to expansions and some related in uh, staffing, the council has given OHR quite a few new responsibilities, including uh, by expanding the definition of workplace harassment, clarifying the HRA's applicability to independent contractors, extending workplace protections to domestic workers, making homelessness um, a protected uh, characteristic, and tasking you with compiling government sexual harassment reports. What's your plan for making sure the agency and the broader public can adjust to these improvements in addition to, to handling the work that uh, the agency was already handling? Sure. Uh, so as you know, Chair, I deeply believe in community education and outreach. And so our outreach and communication team has been working closely with our legal team in order to provide uh, additional information around the laws. In fact, I'm proud to tell you, just I think uh, as of earlier this week, we have uh, hot off the press guidance documents on these new laws and provisions. And in fact, Part of the reason why we held the open house today uh, was to share details about these new laws. So that's that's been an undertaking that we, we've 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 had um, internally. As I mentioned, I think having more structure to our additional staffing will help with processing these additional claims much more expediently. Um, what what do you see as the the biggest challenge for OHR in the year ahead? Uh, so, Chairperson, I think um, as OHR grows, uh, we again, my, my answer seems to be the same, but it's investing in our people. And this is why I keep saying that, because uh, even though OHR has grown, we need more oversight, we need more management, we need more support. And so those are all of the things that I plan on implementing and instituting in FY23. And I have a strong team, small as it, it may be, a mighty team behind me to help me make that into a reality in FY23. But I think that's, that's going to be the biggest challenge is to get people in here, get them trained, get them, you know, acclimated with our very unique process of processing cases, as well as providing education if you're in that unit, and ensuring that there is stability and continuity within OHR that OHR has um, not had the benefit of having. And so my goal is to, again, also establish uh, incentive award plans. And uh, unfortunately, last year, we didn't have, um, it wasn't budgeted <laughs> appropriately, but this year I've worked to, to do that so that we can have incentive awards. I have um, asked my managers to talk to their staff about uh, career growth for our staff, not just the OHR, but in government altogether. And so with all of those and, you know, creating um, the reorganization will also help with 
uh, establishing new career paths for individuals at OHR. And so I am um, very focused on truly investing in our people, both internally and externally. But internally speaking, we need stability and continuity and technical support, which is all uh, what I'm working on in FY23, should I be confirmed. Right. And one of the things I'm hearing with respect to people who work in the agency is that in addition to new FTEs getting getting filled and sort of some restructuring that require people that aren't currently uh, it, it, positions that don't currently exist, you're working to make sure that there is room for growth for people with, within the agency. Correct. Okay. Correct. Uh, what, what about with respect to public education and, and outreach? Uh, that is one um, uh, of many uh, sort of tasks of the agency, you know, as these new laws come, uh, come into play, how, how do you, how do you manage public education and, and in what way does that look different than it did in the past? Say with like, what's the difference between, uh, you know, ban the box when that came into play and, and new laws that are uh, coming into play now? How, how does that public education change? Uh, so I think um, public education has always been an important part of OHR. Um, but we um, did not have as many resources as we do today. And so I think we can amplify our efforts better today in FY23. Uh, we also have learned from our experiences with Band the Box, for instance, and learning to educate not just in one community, but in, in the, all the communities that are in impacted by any given new provision or law. And so that kind of uh, deeply thoughtful reflection of what kind of tailored uh, at which uh, plan we need to have requires consultation with our legal team. And as the agency grows and as new laws are added, uh, it just means that we need to have even more training for it, the, the people that are providing training and outreach to, to, to the community. So uh, one example of doing that in FY22 is that we had what's called a legal eagle training uh, mm -hmm. for our community and outreach team where they were trained by our legal team. So they have a, a robust and clear understanding of just how these laws work um, because they, they do take a little bit of different paths depending on which law you're talking about. Okay. So, uh, so, so over the years, changes in process increases in, in staff um, and sort of lear learning from the past and, and to be more proactive in, in ways. Exactly. Thank you for summing up my response. Um, the, um, what what performance metrics do you monitor most closely or have you monitored most closely as interim director to determine whether the agency is, is making progress? Um, you know, I really look at the performance metrics in all of our units because I think all of the work that we do are so um, tied and connected and impactful for our communities. Uh, but certainly uh, one that I, I'm proud to share is our um, ability to conduct intakes within 30 days of the intake um, or the charge reaching our intake officer. Um, our goal was to, I believe, uh, meet 75%. And this past year, I'm proud to share, it's 89% of the times um, we conducted uh, intakes within 30 days. Um, and we conducted a, a much larger number of intakes um, this in F Y22. Um, the other, of course, is tracking our, our efforts in investigating cases. And so I'm pleased to share that, you know, our inventory of cases um, for our age cases, we uh, set out to uh, complete investigation in 50% of those cases. And I'm, I'm proud to report that my team worked really hard to do that. And as I mentioned before, with the addition of the general counsel in, in April 2014, and then additional uh, attorneys coming on since then, we saw a doubling of our case processing uh, rate in the, the fourth quarter of FY22. So metrics like that is something I keep up with and that, you know, in some ways <laughs> keeps me up um, from week to week to make sure I have a good pulse on. Um, and with respect to our um, education and community and compliance work, I'm, I, I, I am just... Um, you know, eager to share with you all that in FY22, despite coming out of the pandemic and COVID, we train about 143 uh, human rights liaison training, and that is about triple the amount of people we've ever trained 
trained in OHR's history. Uh, so really proud of that effort. And the other effort that I um, have been tracking and close, uh, keeping a close eye on is our youth bullying prevention work. And so even though our manager uh, was a new manager that joined us uh, later in the year in FY22, he has been um, very uh, steadfastly working and was able to circulate about 2,800 documents about tip, uh, tip about youth bullying prevention tip sheets, as well as um, um, uh, guidance for parents through the DCPL. Okay. Um, on the investigation, what's what's the timeline uh, that, that you're measuring? What's that? The investigations, uh, timeline for investigations, it was one of the, the things you mentioned you measured. Sure, um, there are multiple ways that we, we look at our timelines, but, but one goal that we set out to achieve, one of amongst many uh, that we set out to achieve in FY20, Two was with respect to our inventory of age cases. And so, as you know, we have three enforcement teams, plus we set out to establish a fourth enforcement team called the SWAT team that you might remember, um, which we call the special work assignment team. So we were able to successfully establish that fourth team uh, uh, later in quarter four. But prior to that, the three teams had a goal of completing investigations in those age cases. We had a focus on closing those age cases in 50% of our inventory, which we did. Okay. So that's what I was mentioning. Thank you uh, for, for expounding on that. Uh, you mentioned in, in your testimony that, that one of your previous roles prior, prior to uh, being the interim director was uh, in OHR's legislative affairs uh, as the manager. Um, how did that experience inform your uh, approach directing the agency? Uh, thank you. Yeah, I think that uh, experience was extremely valuable in my current role uh, because I had firsthand ability to uh, understand what the process looks like for legislation um, and to work in a timely fashion um, with the council as well as the community advocates who may be interested in these legislation, uh, as well as our executive partners to, again, effectively uh, work through an issue. And so that helps uh, um, greatly in having a front end understanding of what's coming down the pike and then being able to share that with my team and uh, amplify that kind of knowledge uh, so that we can prepare ahead of time once a legislation does become law, I think is uh, very meaningful for the agency. Okay. Um, how, how does... Um staff retention look these days in the agency? Um, I think it looks pretty good. <laughs> uh, we've just had uh, a few uh, departures. I don't have the exact number, um, but I'm happy to follow up with you, but um, it is uh, just very few um, departures in okay. FY22. <clears throat> and do you have a, a way of uh, measuring or, or keeping a pulse on uh, morale and, and whether staff feel supported. And, and I ask this in particular, uh, not because of any concerns that I've, I've seen with you as a director, uh, only just sort of looking broadly globally uh, at employment, retention, recruiting challenges. Uh, yeah, so as I mentioned before, one of my, uh, I have sort of a multi-pronged approach to ensuring there is positive um, staff morale at OHR, and one, of course, is career path and incentive awards, but the, the other one is really to make sure that we, including myself, um, the managers and the director, are in tune with our staff and what is of uh, pressing concerns for them. Uh, you know, if they need additional support to provide the additional support, uh, if they have questions about how to, again, advance in their career path and asking and understanding where they want to go in their career, I think that's important. So, um, we had a uh, manager's retreat with all of our managers where um, I had engaged in a conversation about, you know, what they need, what they think I could improve in, that sort of thing, so that we can really truly work together and understand. But I also recently had a um, informal lunch with our investigators, to sit down with them and connect with them to see what's working, what's not working, um, and to continue to do that. So I'm as time permits, uh, you know, when I can reorganize a little bit better and my time frees up more, my um, plan is to continue to stay in touch with my folks internally here at OHR and have standing uh, bi-monthly, you know, informal lunch uh, with folks so that they can connect with me and I can understand um, firsthand uh, any successes and uh, challenges that we have. Okay. And do you, you believe that this uh, method of, of engaging with, with your team 
uh, gives you a sufficient feedback from uh, staff in the agency? I, I believe so. Um, I did ask the uh, team when I did this um, informal lunch with the investigators for the first time if they thought it was helpful. Um, uh, they certainly said they did and they wanted to continue to have a standing um, meeting. So I take that as a, a positive <laughs> uh, a reaction from the team. Uh, you know, obviously, I also encourage uh, managers to do a, a regular check in with me and staff. And in fact, I have what, what's called an open door outlook policy. And what that is, is that I encourage all my staff to say, go on my outlook calendar. If you see an open spot, just take it. I'm happy to meet with you. And, and several of them have taken advantage of that. Excellent. Um, some agency process questions that, that have arisen recently that I'd like to get clarity on. Who drafts letters of determination at OHR? So the investigator uh, would draft the letter of determination and then that determination will be reviewed for legal sufficiency by our attorneys um, and then would have uh, my signature on it uh, once it's legally sufficient. Okay. They, okay. They um, was was this at one time in, in done in the office of the general counsel? Uh, not during my time. Okay. Uh, uh, since you know, twenty fifteen, at least. Okay. And what what's the status of the third party analysis of other jurisdictions as civil rights uh, agency procedures uh, that your agency commissioned last year? We were able to complete our, uh, we worked with a, an outside vendor to complete that um, uh, review. And so the preliminary uh, understanding, and we're working on issuing a, a publication um, for the public to consume. Um, but a preliminary finding is that 180 days <laughs> is, is, is far too short of a time and that we actually are doing quite well compared to other jurisdictions who take about two years on average to process the case. So um, we've not had the chance to digest all of the, the findings, if you will, or from that uh, review, but we are preparing this year to produce something for public consumption that will have all of that information as well. And certainly, um, you know, not just for production, but for us to learn from it and, and make changes um, as we need. Okay. Do, do you have a sense of timing for when you'll share that? Uh, yes. Um, we're hopeful for end of quarter two. Okay. What are your plans for the language access program? I'm happy to report, and I don't know if you've had the pleasure of uh, meeting our language access director, Rosa Carrillo, but she's just amazing, dedicated leader at the agency. Um, you know, she really keeps in touch with our uh, communities, our government agencies. Uh, she works day and night to work on um, ensuring that agencies are complying with our language access uh, provisions. You know, she works on, um, for example, I'm happy to report she and our um, uh, uh, returning citizen affairs liaison, Charles Thornton, worked on ensuring language access for our DC residents at the Department of Corrections. And so, you know, she's just a dedicated manager and um, she has a, a robust, strong, dedicated team. And I work with them on a, a monthly basis or so to understand any challenges that they might have. And we work together to speak with covered entities as necessary to make sure they're complying with our corrective actions and any preliminary solutions we might have developed prior to an investigation. Okay. Uh, and I have met her. I can't remember if it was at a hearing or a meeting, uh, but, but, I, but I have met her uh, virtually, at least at this point. Um, one of the, the things I've discussed uh, with the agency in the past, um, mostly I think prior to your tenure as uh, interim director, um, it is the issue of, of outreach. And, and you've mentioned uh, quite a bit of this today, but specifically with respect to reaching residents on the east end of, of the city, um, how, how confident are you that, that OHR's uh, information is, is getting to, to all parts of the city? Yeah, uh, you know, it was challenging, I will say, in FY22. We did a number of things like uh, listening labs, 
we did a number of things um, like going to various events in, in those communities. Um, but um, I think because again, as we were uh, coming out of COVID and pandemic, um, it, it was hard to get people out. So then we learned to pivot and do hybrid um, sessions where people could come in person or they could access it. We try to record it, um, have it available uh, so that people can um, have access to the information even if they can't make it on a given time. So that is the beauty of being able to, to do hybrid outreach meetings. But I'm very confident that um, we, we are continuing to do more of these sessions, more of these outreach events with our, our communities uh, uh, east of the river. Um, and so we'll continue to do so in FY23. Okay. Um, is, um, those are all the questions I, I have. Is, is there anything else that, uh, that, that hasn't come up that, that you wanna share before we close? No, I just uh, appreciate uh, your support and the opportunity to to provide my very extensive testimony that I, I gave this this afternoon, and I'm just very proud to be in this uh, in this service role and hope to be able to continue in FY23 and the new calendar year. I appreciate it. Well, I was uh, I was excited to see your your nomination. I, I think uh, I, I've been really impressed with. Uh, progress that I've seen in the agency uh, since you've been been at the helm um, for, for about a year now. Uh, so um, I want to thank you for the work that that, that you've done and, uh, and and wish you continued success in, in the agency. Uh, also want to mention for anybody who uh, wants to testify or weigh in uh, but wasn't able to join us today, uh, the committee does accept written testimony. It will be made part of the official record. Uh, so if you would like to submit testimony, uh, please email it to the Committee on Government Operations and Facilities at facilities at dccouncil.gov. The record for this roundtable will close at the close of business tomorrow, Friday, December 16th. Uh, finally, if anyone listening is interested in learning more about the work of this committee or my office, um, please sign up for our newsletter at robertwhiteatlarge.com. Uh, so again, uh, Director Kine, thank you for being uh, with us today. Thank you to you and your team for the work that you all do. Uh, with that, the business before this committee is concluded. The time is now 3.26 p.m. and this roundtable is adjourned. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you. Have a great rest of your day. You too. Take care. Bye-bye.